Today I'm going to show you what's inside of the Lexus hybrid drive system and how it works. Now this is the power inverter out of a 2006 Lexus RX 400H and in this video we're going to be focusing on the power electronics and how power flows in and out of this inverter to motivate the vehicle. Now if you want to learn more about how the motors and gears work and the transmission make sure you check the link above. Now this power inverter is responsible for translating the 288 volts direct current that comes from the battery located underneath the vehicle's rear seats into alternating current which are going to go to three electric motors we have mg1 mg2 and mgr which powers the rear wheel it's also going to power the ac compressor because that's electric on this vehicle and charge the 12 volt battery in the back of the trunk because there's no alternator on this vehicle all right let's pop this cover off to see what's inside let's pop the cover off here like we got some sound deadening so the first thing we have here is a control board and that's going to interface through can bus to the vehicle's powertrain control module let's take this apart coil these screws here all right, we'll just pull this off here. Very simple. We got a couple of ICs on there. All right, next up, I got to remove this capacitor. There's a couple of tens going all the way around. Pull up on this fuse or a resistor here. Got one more here. Now I can pull out this whole capacitor. So inside here you can see these are bus bars. They're very thick because they have to carry very high amperage. Now all I see here are bare 10 millimeter bolts. I'm just gonna go ahead and start zipping everything off. So I'll pull off this bus over here. Now I can pull off this bus. We got one more bus over here. Next up we have another film capacitor and it's got two wires here. All right, next up we've got another module in here. We switch from 10 mils to five mil hex. Pull this guy up. Oh, it's got some thermal paste on it. Here we've got a bracket and this looks like some connections here that go out to the motor. Next up we have a bunch more hexes that hold this IGBT module on. Oh yeah. You can see there's thermal paste on the bottom there. On these two terminals here, it looks like we do have two small resistors, but it's bolted on from the bottom. So let's flip this case over. Now, despite having taken out so much weight in capacitors and transistors, this thing's still pretty hefty, which means that we got a lot to discover down below. This thing kind of looks like a transmission pen. Bunch of 10 mils. Cleanest transmission pan ever. Taking a look under the inverter, we have yet another film capacitor. Then we have a reactor. And then we have, looks like another converter. So let's check this out. I'm going to start by taking off these bus bars here. So you know the bus bars are pretty thick and healthy. The wiring here. The electrical connections for the capacitor at the top here. And I can remove this capacitor. So the bus bar that connects to this module here. It actually connects down to those two little prongs we saw on the bottom. And if you pull this out, you've got a junction block that goes from one side to the other. And this was a resistor here that went across the capacitor. That's just to slowly discharge the capacitor so that you don't get shocked by the time you get in here. Speaking of getting shocked, I'm surprised that there's no lockout switch on the cover compared to the Prius that had a safety switch. So if we take a look at what happens to the voltage inside of this inverter, we start here at 288 volts DC at the high voltage battery. First goes to the boost circuit, which is going to bring that up to say like 500 volts DC and then it goes to the gate drive circuit where we have the switching transistors Now those are going to switch on and off very rapidly in order to create a sine wave which basically becomes alternating current the AC is then going to feed the three phase motors you can see here they're phased 120 degrees apart from each other peak to peak to peak and that's what's going to allow the motor to have lots of torque and a decent amount of resolution for it to rotate let's say under regenerative braking and you're slowing down well that power is now going to go to the rectifiers which sat beside the IGBTs and that's going to rectify this alternating current from plus and minus just into positive waveforms. They're going to go to that big smoothing capacitor and make the ripple very very small to where it can now become direct current and charge the high voltage battery. Taking a look at some of the components on the bottom here, we've got our boost converter as well as our reactor, which is a giant coil, and then we have a film capacitor. So how all these components works is we've got our high voltage here that's going to come into our converter. That's going to control this coil. Now we're going to excite this coil with direct current, and that's going to create a giant magnetic field. Now when you remove that current, the magnetic field is going to collapse on itself, creating an inrush of current in the same direction that the voltage is coming from the high voltage battery. And instead of only having 288 volts, you now have like five six hundred volts going to the electric motors which makes them turn more efficiently that's how you can get away with using a smaller electric battery with a lower voltage to turn such a big vehicle down the road now the boost converter also connects to the capacitor so we've got our inductor and capacitor forming an lc circuit now both of these components here are bolted down to the casing here which is water cooled because they require a lot of cooling so let me pop off this bus over here and remove this capacitor all right let's see if we can get this reactor 
as you can see there's a lot of white thermal paste this is going to be like anti seize going all over your gloves even though you didn't touch it and our boost controller here taking a look at this circuit board over here we've got 288 volts direct current and we need to charge the 12 volt battery so we do that by taking 288 volts through these two wires over here sending it through these igbt's which are going to turn it into alternating current that's going to work the transformers because you know transformers only work with alternating current it's a center tap transformer which is going to take off 14 volts you then have to use these diodes to turn it back into dc again send it through this inductor and then straight out the post over here which is going to go to the fuse box and to charge the 12 volt battery at the back of the vehicle kind of seems a little inefficient to go from dc to ac and then back to dc again just because transformers work that way i wish they could have came up with a better technology now that was more efficient than all this i'm just gonna go old school here and use a screwdriver try to give up i gotta get the drill out all right let's see if we got everything first take off this inductor very simple coil it's also got thermal paste on the bottom then we'll take off this board I did miss one screw off this transformer now I can take off the circuit board if I turn the circuit board over you'll see on the back side of the transformer here are the transistors that create that alternating current and these are the diodes and they press up against this casing here with thermal tape is a heck of a lot cleaner than thermal paste now I think it's easier to explain how this works as I take this apart so we'll start at the top here you see we have our little control module which interfaces with the vehicle's CAN bus next up we have our smoothing capacitor now this one is going to smoothen out those AC sine waves as it's coming in from the electric motor during regenerative braking and turn it into direct current so we can charge the high voltage battery this one's rated at 750 volts and 972 microfarads and it's quite hefty on the bottom of the capacitor we've got direct current coming in from the high voltage battery this one here takes direct current down to the dc to dc converter and this one gets dc current directly to the four-wheel drive module now inside of here we can see we've got our intelligent power module and that connects to these two bus bars one goes to mg1 with three phases over there the other one connects up to mg2 and those connect up to the back of the casing over here so the intelligent power module is going to take 288 volts direct current coming from the battery and that capacitor and turn it into three phase ac current whereas then be sent out to the two electric motors in the front wheels one set of these three and the other set with these three there is a small film capacitor sitting on top here and this one's only rated at 1.72 microfarads and before i get that out there is one more bus bar and that goes from the four wheel drive module to feed the rear wheels through its own ac electric motor so i'm going to take out this four wheel drive module very simple again we've got high voltage coming in that connected to that capacitor and three phase ac current that's going to go out to that rear motor i will have another video on how that rear differential is set up so make sure you stay tuned for that video and finally here are the connector bobs that go to the ac motor in the rear and here we come to the intelligent power module now because this has got a lot of transistors and diodes inside switching on and off we do have to have thermal paste on the back there so that it can conduct heat down into this aluminum casing i'm gonna grab my brother's old wedding shirt here i'm sure he doesn't need that anymore and i'm gonna wipe this uh, ipm off because my hands are turning almost as dirty as my kids diapers just touching all this thermal paste now believe it or not this is where the majority of failures happen with these power electronics and that's because you need to have a perfect surface to transfer heat from your IPM module over to the casing so that you can dissipate that heat. If your thermal paste is starting to wear down or you don't have enough coolant in the system and you overheat it well these IPMs are going to start to fail and although it is a separate piece replaceable it's still going to be pretty expensive. We've also got these loops going around here and that's a current sensor so it's kind of like a closed loop control circuit and senses how much current is dumping into your electric motor. All right, I'm going to see if we can release this pop this off here the cover with just the terminals on it so here is the intelligent power module inside of here we have diodes as well as transistors you can see sort of this half represents mg1 and this half represents mg2 i'm going to go around and remove all these little screws now if you look closely you'll see that the transistors and diodes are actually soldered to the board itself so it's not easy to get this off without putting it in an oven i'm just going to gently try to pry up on this Watch this board we can get off here. Pop this plate off. These are the transistors. And there's a look at the transistors and the diodes. Now everything is covered in a gel and that's to help with transmitting heat. You can see it's so easy to damage these transistors. The leads are very, very thin. Don't you love breaking stuff that's so delicate? Makes you feel so good. It kind of reminds me of when I broke into my brother's electronics drawer when I was a kid. You just damage whatever you feel like and run away. Now electronically speaking, you can see how that high voltage is gonna come down to the transistor itself here. It's gonna be switched on and off by this transistor, being controlled by that circuit board that was on top 
top here and then eventually make its way over to one of the phases over here. Of course we have U, V and W phases which are three phases 120 degrees apart from each other. So here's the driver for the rear electric motor. It has a very similar concept DC in three phase AC out. You can see it's less than half the size of the module for the front electric motors and that's because it's meant to be a part-time slip and grip system. You don't use this motor for a very long time. The motor itself isn't cooled very well either. Don't worry I'll have a tear down on this motor and the front electric motors in a future video. It's coming soon. All right you guys asked for it. I'm gonna tear this one down just for fun. So once again, just like in here, you can see the IGBT or insulated gate bipolar transistors inside of here. One, two, three, four, five, six of them. I'm going to be using my special removal tool over here. And look how much smaller those transistors are compared to the transistors in the front motor. And you can see the voltage path goes from DC over here to the three phase AC as it comes down for each phase. And this is also covered in a cool little gel as well. It's also messed up my hands because I didn't clean this one. I guess having it separate makes it more modular when they have to produce front wheel drive and all wheel drive versions of this RX and Highlander. Now you can imagine these transistors are doing a great job of switching on and off to create alternating current. Now when the electric motors are now in braking mode and they're creating alternating current during regenerative braking it's going to be fed back into this intelligent power module now the diodes inside of here are going to start to flatten those out but your signal is still going to have a bit of rippling to it and that's where these capacitors come in now the smoothing capacitor is there just to smoothen off all those ripples and make these signal really nice and smooth so they can go back to the high voltage battery and charge it up now i'm not going to be opening this smoothing capacitor because i tried doing that in the first prius video teardown that i did and i got banned from my wife and the in-laws for a week as juice started spraying out of it. Not to mention I don't want to get banned by YouTube for dangerous operation. But as you can imagine there's a lot of little plates inside of here that run back and forth with a lot of acid kind of similar to how a battery works and of course we have our hookups to our direct current. So anything going back to the battery is going to be filtered out by this capacitor. Now this little resistor here sits across the capacitor just to kind of discharge it slowly over time. That's because in case you open up the inverter without realizing the key is on you don't get shocked with the full voltage. You might get shocked with half of it which might still send you to the hospital. I'm just surprised there's no safety interlock switch on the cover of the this thing like there was with the Trius. I feel like they kind of cheaped out on the bus bars. They're not as shiny and they're made of aluminum instead of copper which conducts a lot better. Now after the current leaves the capacitor it's going to head over to the battery. Now the battery's got its own entire high voltage ECU and its own setup which is actually fairly interesting on its own. Now the hybrid battery lives underneath the back seat so I had to clear out the trunk and the back seats just to get to it. And here we have the battery removed from the vehicle with the covers removed. You can see there are three separate battery packs. When you add them all together it becomes 288 volts deep. DC. Now each one of these three cell packets here have their own cooling fan at the back here that's going to suck air from inside the cabin below the rear seat through the battery pack and then send it out towards the trunk. It's always important to keep this vent clean so once in a while just come in here with your wife's toothbrush and clean off some of that dirt inside of there so that these batteries can always keep cool and not get clogged up. Now if you remember the previous videos that I've done the battery pack is kind of all compacted in the trunk and it doesn't have that great of cooling. This one has three separate fans which is going to give you much better cooling and that's probably why these RX and Highlander batteries last so long because they're just so much more efficient at cooling. Taking a closer look at some of these components, this here is the battery voltage sensor which is basically going to control the entire battery system, the fans, the cooling, the voltage and everything and report it back to the main ECU. So this is going to have temperature sensors that run to every other cell in order, don't touch it's high voltage. It's fine. Daddy. It's also going to talk to the main ECU to tell it if you want to work on electric mode or if you want to do some regen when you're braking or what the condition of the batteries are overall. This side here we have our battery contactors. It's basically a giant relay so it uses 12 volts in order to turn on the high voltage system when you turn on the car. So you have your 288 volts coming out through here. Now the most important thing when working on hybrid batteries is this little service plug which plugs in here. It's basically going to open circuit this battery so that you can safely work on other components. Now in this case it's very rudimentary. It's just a pin that completes the circuit. But but on newer models the service plugs include fuses that will automatically blow when say your airbag goes off then you got to replace that expensive service plug. There's not much to it but it can definitely save your life. And at least this part is serviceable if you take off that side panel underneath the chair. Fans themselves are basically like small blower motors. I just wish that they made 
filters for them that you can replace on the outside. Now sometimes batteries have to vent harmful gases. That's why you have this tube traveling across here and that goes to this tube that goes underneath the car. Now the blower motor actually has ductwork underneath here where it kind of sucks air through in between these cells to help cool them off. And you've got these little prongs over here which also help force air in between the cells because the center ones are usually the hottest and they tend to wear out faster than the outside ones. Now speaking of when wearing out, when you rebuild these you can load test them to see which ones are good and replace the bad ones and make sure they're all balanced correctly as if you're refurbishing a battery. Of course replacing a battery is going to be a lot more expensive especially if you want to go with OEM but there are aftermarket solutions available but they typically don't last as long. You get what you pay for with hybrid batteries. Honestly this looks like an original battery from 2006 and this car had 411,000 kilometers on it and it still is a strong battery. It's kind of scary that all the rust was leaking up inside the vehicle in the battery pack though. Let me see if I can split the case to take a look at the cooling system. Now as we saw, a lot of the electronics rely on this casing to get cooled off. Here we have the coolant that's going to come in from this fitting and that's going to go through these fins here which are going to maximize the surface area for heat transfer between the aluminum and the coolant itself. It's then going to come around here and exit here before cooling the transmission and then going out to its own dedicated radiator. Now because the inverter has its own coolant circuit, it's going to have its own water pump to circulate it. I was able to find two different kinds of water pump in this vehicle. Taking a look at the full system diagram of this hybrid system, we've got our traditional 12 volt battery that powers all of the electronics. Then we've got a high voltage 288 volt battery, which is ultimately going to turn into alternating current to power MG2 to move the vehicle down the road. We've also got our internal combustion engine controlled by a typical ECU. That mostly turns on to turn MG1 to control the speed of MG2, but also to generate power through a diode rectifier system. And that'll go back and charge your high voltage battery. However, because you don't have a typical alternator on this car, that high voltage battery has to go to a DC to DC converter to step it down so it can charge that 12 volt battery. In addition, the high voltage battery also runs an AC compressor because when you're in idle stop mode, your wife's not going to want to go without AC, unlike the first generation Prius where you had to run the internal combustion to get AC. Heck, even the water pump and the cooling system on this engine is run by electronics and that's what's going to run coolant through this entire thing to cool things down. Finally, you have to have a high voltage ECU to control this all and make sure nothing tries to skip ahead of each other and burn down and to think all of this was invented more than 25 years ago is quite amazing and that's a look at how the power electronics work in the lexus hybrid system very interesting to see how high voltage is switched and converted over to ac in order to power the electric motors inside of the transmission and the differential casing and then vice versa when you're in regenerative braking to bring it back through the smoothing capacitor and charge the battery again it's actually very similar to an electric car the only added complexity is you do have to talk to an internal combustion engine as that's what keeps all of these systems running by burning gasoline. Now it's been proven over time that Toyota's hybrid system is very reliable. This particular one is 20 years old and still running. You do have to keep up on your fluid changes, especially the coolant system inside of the inverter and transmission assembly. And of course the transmission has its own fluid as well. Make sure you support me on Patreon and subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.